What's that book you've been reading about? It's about heroes who get to go on adventures, defeat the monsters, and save the day. Little boy from the south side of Chicago, the only tourists that get to do that. This story is about my father and the secret birthright that's been kept from us. You're going after it. We're going near the car. He's gonna stand there, Tick. This is family business. And family stay together. Dad for my own, scared for myself. Just because they don't want you here doesn't mean you're not supposed to be. I gotta get away. This is an invitation to unmitigated power. Where in the hell did I go wrong with you, boy? I told you to stay away from that damn place. There's something here. Just trying to get out. Everything is where and as it should be. From God to man to creature. win this game they set up for you to play. This legacy belongs to our family. We gotta face this new world. Instinct, I'll claim in it. This is our family story. All right, I'm here with Matt Ruff, Lovecraft Country, which is based on the book of the same name by Matt Ruff, premieres Sunday, August 16th at 9 p.m. on HBO. And Matt's latest book, 88 Names, is available now on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Matt, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Um, How exciting a time is this for you? Because you have your book. (laughs) It was, you wrote it like 2016, and now it's 2020. And you're on HBO, which you can say all you want about like uh, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, but HBO is, that's the gold standard of TV shows, especially like hour long dramas on television. Yeah, it really is. It's funny just watching. Yeah, just, just, you know, it's, it's like everything is as good as it's going to get with this. So (laughs) I've been doing that thing though, because, you know, where I'm just waiting for like my karma to balance out, like I'm going to get hit by a bus or, or something like the day before the show airs. And uh, yeah, (laughs) but um, no, I, I just feel like, yeah, I got the golden ticket with this. So you write Lovecraft country in 2016 and what's the path that it becomes now? Because for the, the subject matter of this book, there's no better timing than for it to come out right now. Taking yeah, that, consideration all the BLM and protests, where the country is right now, there's no better time for this. Well, it's funny. This, this goes back actually a lot longer. I mean, I, I originally pitched the, the idea for the story as a TV series, as a possible TV series in 2007. And the, wow. the folks I was talking to at the time, you know, they were very nice, but the idea of doing a, a you know, an, a historical supernatural drama about racism with a, a all black ensemble cast in 2007, that was just a little out there on the edge of sure. things. And I, I didn't do the things that you could do to make that a little more palatable. Like I didn't give the main character a white friend for the audience <laughs> to identify with. I just, because I was like, no, if I'm going to do a story about, you know, about, the horrors of racism. I want to stay focused on the characters who are, who, for whom it really is a horror. And I don't want to give that easy out. And if you can't identify with these folks as they are, if you need somebody to help you with that, then you're not going to like the show anyway. And yeah. So they, you know, they were very nice, but they, the folks I was talking to passed on it, but the idea just kind of had me hooked. And I was like, I, I want to see what I can do with this. And the nice thing about being a novelist is that there's always a plan B. So mm-hmm. I was like, let me see if I can figure out how to make this work as a book. And the idea in the back of my head was always that, yes, if, if the book is successful and good, it can be a proof of concept that, see, this, this really can work as a TV series. And 
What I did not expect was the part where the book comes out right at the time when Jordan Peele had just was finishing up Get Out and was thinking about what he was going to do next. And so, so it comes out before Get Out because it yeah, also it, should let people know J.J. Abrams, Jordan Peele are the producers on this. Yeah, and Misha Green's the uh, is the developed it. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, it was it it came out and right away the book got a lot more interest from Hollywood than I usually get, which told me I was on the right track. And then uh, my CIA agent called me up one day and said, "Oh, you know, this is kind of odd, but Jordan Peele wants to talk to you. And you know, he's mostly known for comedy, but apparently he's looking to break into horror." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, I'm happy sure. to talk to anybody." And then I found out Misha Green's going to be on the call too. And then I got really excited because I'd, I'd seen Underground. I loved her work. And, and I knew too that, that the fact that she got Underground made meant she knew the, the secret words to say to TV executives to not make them run screaming from the mm -hmm. idea. Um, and we had a wonderful phone conversation. One of the rare cases where you're talking to people from Hollywood and you're all talking about the same novel. And That's pretty shocking. It. Yeah. So as soon as I got off the phone, I was like, this is no contest. I really hope these folks are the ones who, you know, I want them to be the ones to do this and I hope we can make a deal. And uh, we did. And then yeah, what, a few you... weeks later, Get Out trailer drops and I'm like, oh, okay. Now I get why. Yeah. Now I get why Jordan wants to do this. And, yeah. yeah. And then he ends up hosting the Twilight Zone and then, uh, you know, us yeah. and then everything else comes out. Yeah. And I mean, this must have played in perfectly then because when I first picked up the book now i discovered the book because i saw the trailer for the hbo show and oh, wow. i was a, <laughs> yeah uh and i'm a giant lovecraft fan and since i was a kid and but i think the issue is whenever anything is associated with lovecraft goes to the screen sometimes or more often than not at least in my opinion it hasn't been very good but then i see this trailer for lovecraft country and then i look into it i see yeah. oh it's a book i get the book and i read it in a day i couldn't put it down it's so goddamn good Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, well, that's the thing. Lovecraft, yeah, he's not, he's not a very cinematic guy, really. No. I mean, it's, it's all about, you know, academics and scientists wandering around, archaeologists wandering around in ruins, and it's just a lot of internal monologue, and oh, you know, look at that thing over there that if I were paying attention would, would scare the crap out of <laughs> yeah. me and having me running for the hills, but I'm just going to keep walking that way and walking yeah. that way, and yeah. And then at the very end, they die or go crazy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's not, yeah, it's not a nail biting action adventure kind of thing. This was, no, this was more really the, 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 the building block for Lovecraft Country, the initial inspiration was more X-Files where I wanted to have a recurring cast of characters having, you know, a series of paranormal adventures. And then the twist was it's a black family in the 1950s who are also dealing with all the realities of, of legal segregation and Jim Crow. And, you know, playing those two types of horror off against each other. And Lovecraft came in as a way of bridging paranormal horror and white supremacy, basically. And that's, yeah, that's because the title. Yeah. Because uh, Lovecraft didn't have a problem dropping end bombs. I mean, he yeah. was just an out and out racist. It was, it's just, oh, it's it, out there. More than, more than that. I mean, yeah, he was just white people were the pinnacle of human evolution. And yeah, so it's, it's, um, so yeah, and it's it's about that, and then the the main character Atticus and his uncle George, who runs this travel agency in in um, in Chicago, they are both also nerds. They're the kind of people who would love the kind of thing that Lovecraft writes, if only it would let them in and and didn't push them away. And it's that's another function that Lovecraft kind of serves in the novel as sort of the ultimate, ex, you know, capturing this uh, the difficulty that black science fiction fans had and, and, and still have sometimes and with dealing with genres that just don't love them back. And um, you, you sh showed that off perfectly very early on in the book when uh, Atticus is talking to his uncle George and he gives him a poem by Lovecraft and saying, look, this is the guy you like reading. Well, it's not his uncle George who does that. It's his dad. Excuse me, his father. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, his, it's, it's like, yes, if, you, if you're a white kid who thought you had trouble getting your parents to, to like go along with that wacky stuff you like to read, imagine if, you're, if your dad could say, well, not only is this crap, but you know, the, you're, the hero of the book is a, is a Confederate soldier or the, the yeah. guy who wrote the book thinks you were less than human and, and you, why would you want to read that? And so yeah, that's the other difficulties. He wants to love it, and then he can't even defend it to his own family. So yeah, yeah, it was it was such a it was very eye opening. For, so that's something I never thought about as a, as I was a white nerdy kid reading every book you mentioned that Atticus or George or his father read. I read as a kid and never thought about it from the black point of view. 
Well, and the thing about it is too, I mean, you know, that's the other thing is like it, this, this impulse where you don't want to look at the, the, you know, you just want to look away. If, even if you notice that stuff, you kind of want to ignore it. That's like mm -hmm. the, the black nerds experience that too. You're reading something and your dad's trying to point out, Hey, this, this genre doesn't respect you. And you're like, dad, leave me alone. Let me just have fun. And yeah. So there's a lot of common feeling there. It's just, it's, it's a harder thing for them because at some point he wakes up and says, oh yeah, dad kind of has a point, doesn't he? Yeah. So yeah. what the story lets you do though is like they, it's a case of being careful what you wish for because they, they end up living out a, a real life series of, of weird tales with themselves as the stars. So. And I love the, the, like I wasn't expecting it to be, I guess an anthology type series inside the same book with the same characters and then every, you know, and I thought that was, it was so great because I got so attached to Atticus and everyone he was with at the end of the first section of the book. Yeah. And then I just got happier and happier as I went to <laughs> each and each and every other part of the, of the, of the novel. Now, was it yeah. going to be, was it going to be that way from the beginning or do you, were you thinking one whole story? Well, no, the, 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 I mean, this was sort of, again, this is sort of reflects the X-Files origin idea that I wanted to, the hardest part of turning it into novels, I wanted to retain that sort of monster of the week feel where everybody got their chance to be a, a star in a different story, but I didn't want to write a book of short stories. I'm a novel yeah. guy. I wanted it to fit together. And then I realized, well, what I can do is the, the literary equivalent of a, a season of television. If you were just going to sit down and binge watch it, where every chapter is a standalone episode and part of a larger arc story. And then, you know, and, just try and make the first few transitions work so you kind of get into that. And once you realize yeah. what's going on, then you're like, okay, yeah, this is all one thing. It doesn't seem yes. like it at first, but. And that when, once that clicks, it just feels really good to know that you're going to see these yeah. characters that you really fall in love with pretty quickly. At least, at least in my case, you're going to see them again in other adventures or whatever you want to call them, yeah. dealing with, you know, um, interdimensional gateways and uh, the elder gods. Yeah, um, so, so that was, yeah, it was a ball to write too. So now after, so you get the call from Jordan Peele, HBO says they're going to pick it up. How much input do you have in the show once it's out of your hands and in the hands of TV? I, I was not heavily involved in day-to-day -day production. Basically I, I, you know, it gave Misha Green, the showrunner, who's really the person who, who gets all the credit for, I mean, there's a lot of talent involved in this series, but Misha's the one who was like in charge of everything and wrangling all the cats and making sure it all worked according to her vision. And so I gave her my research notes and I gave her some, you know, uh, some thoughts I had about how certain things, you know, could be handled. And then I basically said, you do what you want. I trust you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to move to Hollywood and sit in the writer's room and, and watch, <laughs> look over your shoulders because I've got other things I want to do. And yeah. And there's really a sense where my version of the story is, is, you know, it's on the shelf. It's right behind me there. So I, I didn't need to tell it again. Um, and I, you know, I was a consulting producer. So if they wanted to tap my, you know, my brain or ask me about stuff, they were free to do so. But I was happy to stand back and, and, and let, see what Misha was going to do with it. And, uh, I, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten a sneak preview of the first few episodes and I got to say that was probably a really good choice on my part because I love, I love what she's done with it. So that's, that's really exciting because reading it, I, I didn't, a lot of times, I'm sure, as you know, um, adaptations, <laughs> sometimes there's literally lost in translation. So I, I fell in love with this so much that I was really hoping that the TV show and by the trailer, it looks like it's, it's, you know, it's pretty spot on. What it's, yeah, what it's like, it's like why it's the same story, but in a parallel universe where everything's just a little different and mm -hmm. stuff happens in different order sometimes. And that's the hardest thing for me watching the, watching the, the previews of it was that it was like, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that reveal comes, you know, it's like the mm -hmm. reveals are in slightly different places. And sometimes I'm, I forget, like, wait a minute, what does that mean? What's happening? It's like, oh yeah, I know what happened. I wrote this, but they're, <laughs> they're feeding you the information in a slightly different order. But um, yeah, and, and even, you know, the changes they've made all make sense to me. And it's nice that the, the two versions of it complement each other. So it's not just like you read one or watched one, you don't need to bother with the other. It's like, you can know, you can enjoy it twice in slightly different fashion. So that's and I'm cool. And I'm hoping to, yeah, because you know, from the page to the screen doesn't always translate like Lovecraft's work where, like you said, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. So the entire basis of his entire work and his mythos is um, unimaginable monsters that you can't describe. 
So how does that go on a screen? Well, although, although he had this habit of calling things indescribable and then describing them in great detail, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's weird though. And I, I think just some of it is, yeah, it's just, it's, it, I mean, the most successful ones are the ones that weren't too faithful with him. Like I love the Stuart Gordon movies. I love the, you know, where they use a bit, a bit of comedy. And, sure. and then I've seen some, it's funny, I've been on my website, on my blog, I've been, I've been sort of writing about, I've been binge watching some Lovecraft inspired stories. And, and there are a few I really like. And it's funny, the ones I tend to like are the ones that go for sort of a black and white aesthetic and and like i uh, just this last weekend i was watching uh the call of cthulhu which is they they did the call of cthulhu which is a a story that if you, hollywood did it would cost probably a hundred million dollars with just of the course. special effects alone but yeah. these guys figured out a way to do it for fifty thousand because they did it as a, a silent film oh wow they use the kind of special effects you would have on tap in the 1920s so okay. it's, it's filmed in black and white video and like so for is this thing in the South Atlantic, they basically got guys in a rowboat and then they're doing fabric with glitter on it that they're <laughs> billowing, but it's in black and white and then it's That's been computer great. processed to look like old time film. So it, it works. That's and then awesome. Thulu, when he appears, is a little stop motion animated monster. So it's like King Kong, but that's, with tentacles. That's, that's smart. Yeah, because it would be impossible to create the giant squid monster from another Well, dimension. no, they do it, but it would just be like they they'd spend so much in the CGI and then they wouldn't pay a screenwriter to do good, you know, no, actual no. good dialogue. But <laughs> um but so yeah, you can. It's like I've seen clever low budget stuff, but yeah, the the bigger budget, yeah, that it hasn't happened yet. And it's it's weird because he's in the public domain for the most part. So you could really take this stuff and run with it, but yeah, you totally could. Uh, we're talking about Matt Ruff, a Lovecraft Country. It's based on the book of the same name by Matt. Premieres Sunday, August 16th at 9 p.m. on HBO. And Matt's latest book, 88 Names, is available now on Amazon and wherever books are sold. But it's probably just Amazon at this point because of the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, we'll be honest with everyone. Uh, I found it really interesting also in the book. I, th I don't know if people picked up on this or at least I, it, until reading this, I really didn't, was Atticus and his family, they're, they're experiencing all this racism in the North when I think a lot of people think, oh, racism was only happening in the South. And once, okay. you, get over, once you get over the Mason-Dixon line, everyone's progressive, when that's yeah. totally not the goddamn case. Well, yeah, and, and uh, congratulations for noticing that because I, I'm la I, I still am amused on Twitter how many people, even who have read the book, who seem to think it's set in the South, and it really isn't, except for no. like the first few pages. And yeah, it... Well, that's the whole thing too about the you know the the the, the family in the in the novel they they run a travel agency and they publish a fictional version of the Green Book called the the Safe Negro Travel Guide. And mm -hmm. what a lot of people think is that the Green Book was a book you needed if you were going traveling in the South in those days. And in fact, the South was the one place you didn't need it because the Southerners very kindly provided extensive signage showing you where you were and weren't welcome. And sure. You might see whites only signs in the North and or the West at that time too, but it was less frequent. What, what happened more often is that people were, it was just as segregated. People were just as unwilling to, to rent to you, but um, they wouldn't tell you the reason. So yeah. you, you'd stop at a motel and instead of we, you know, you can't stay here. It was like, Oh geez, forgot to turn on the no vacancy sign. And you go to the next motel and it would be the same story. And, you knew what was going on, but it's like these people not only were discriminating against you, but they were trying to make you crazy in the process. And again, that's very Lovecraftian in its way that it's this mm -hmm. paranoia. And, and so that's where, where guidebooks like that were really important to warn people that not just to avoid embarrassment, also you could, if you startled somebody in the North, they, they were much more likely to turn violent because they just wanted you out of there. So um, yeah, that was something I wanted to capture in the novel too. And that's that, why I said it in Chicago and, and the New England. And that being said, I, I'm gonna, I would say that every interaction that any of the protagonists had with racist white people, cops, et cetera, anyone who, who was anyone like that in the, in, the, in the book was much more terrifying than any of the ceremonies, the monsters, or the hauntings, <laughs> without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's, that was, that was sort of the big question, but I kind of knew what the answer was going in. And, but what's interesting about it is because they've, they've had to live their lives this way and are constantly dealing with this stuff in a way they're, they're much more prepared to accept 
the the magic stuff and the supernatural stuff when it happens because their lives are already so surreal to begin with yeah and, and you know and then atticus and george they've read the stories they know what the rules are too so <laughs> that's so great yeah yeah so it was a lot of it was just a lot of fun to play in and and to, to play with as i was writing it now with lovecraft country getting picked up um is there any interest in any of your other work because over the all right so i discovered lovecraft country over from the trailer and then i went through mirage and um bad monkeys as well and i think either of those books those novels should be te television shows or movies is there any interest whatsoever especially mirage, is, mirage to be totally honest i would love to see mirage um mirage is still mirage is another book that started out as an unsuccessful tv pitch i think it's it's less radioactive than it was when i first came up with the idea this was also the same 2007 TV, tv series pitch series when i was talking to these people i i offered them the Mirage, Lovecraft Country, and 88 Names, and they passed on all of them. And the Mirage was the one where, like, you know, nope, Iraq War is still going on. We cannot do an yeah. alternate reality where United States and, and the Middle East trade places and 9-11 happens with Christian fundamentalists flying planes at the <laughs> towers be, in Baghdad. That's just not That would be great. Happen. Bad Monkeys, though, yeah. The Margot Robbie is actually um, developing that with Universal. So That's really around. exciting. Yeah. I mean, I don't know... It's still under option. I know they still want to do it. I just, I it, like as as with everything else in Hollywood, I don't know how the pandemic is going to affect that because mm -hmm. obviously it's Can't really shoot. hard now to get yeah to get shooting done. And and God, you know, it was just seen today on Twitter. Apparently, John Rhys Davies had to pass on a role because they wouldn't want they wouldn't insure an actor of his age. What the the bond companies, you know, the completion bonds, they wouldn't insure the the production with someone of his age because I guess. There's a risk he'll catch COVID and die before oh. the film is completed. So yeah, they can't make that bet. Yeah, and it's that's it's terribly sad for you know if you're if you're in that demographic and he's like he's he's worried that this might mean he's the, his career is going to be over unless they find a vaccine really soon. So that's um, terribly sad. Yeah, um, but the whole you know Hollywood in general is still figuring out that whole thing. So I don't know what you know I don't know what's gonna what it's going to do, but I, I, I think bad monkeys will happen eventually. Um, well, that's really exciting because I yeah. went through that. I think it was the second of your books I read and I was like, this guy also the way you change genre between books is also, yeah. it's very, it's, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. I really, I'm loving, I love it. Oh, great. Um, and well, Lovecraft country, it's, uh, comes out August 16th at 9 PM on HBO and Matt's latest book, 88 names that's available now on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Matt, seriously, thank you so much for coming on. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, man. This was fun.